Yes, thank you again for having me back. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you all some more um, information and really looking forward to the Q&A afterward. So this is part two of African-American readings of Paul. And just to recap a little bit, the research question that my project um, involved is how have African-Americans interpreted Paul from the 1700s to the mid 20th century? And so the last time we looked at Jarena Lee, if you recall, we looked at um, Zilpha Kla, another um, female black preacher in 19th century. We looked at some early enslaved petitions. And we also looked at James Pennington and Lemuel Haynes, who were also um, protesting slavery in the 19th century. But today, I kind of want to pick up from where we left off and look at Julia Foote, who was another early Black woman preacher. She was born in 1823. She was the first woman ordained a deacon in the AME Zion Church. She eventually was also ordained an elder, second woman to hold that office in her denomination. She wrote an autobiography entitled a brand plucked from the fire, an autobiographical sketch by Mrs. Julia A.J. Foote. And interestingly enough, she converted to Christianity when she was 15 years old. She was young when she became a Christian. And she tells the story in her autobiography of how her conversion came to be. She was listening to a minister preach on Revelation 14.3 about the new song being sung um, around the throne of God. And when she heard the sermon, that idea of the new song struck her so much that she felt like, at first she felt like she couldn't sing that song because of her sinful state. And this is what she said happened to her after she heard that message and a voice was telling her she could not sing this song. So she says, I fell to the floor unconscious and was carried home. Se several people were with me all night singing and praying, and I did not recognize. I'm trying to move this. Sorry. I did not recognize anyone, but seemed to be walking in the dark, followed by someone who kept saying, Such a sinner as you are can never sing that new song. You see, in, in a way, she's kind of having a mystical experience. She's on the floor unconscious. People have to carry her home. And she's at her house. People are around her singing and praying. In great terror, she cried, Lord, have mercy on me, a poor sinner. The voice which had been crying in my ears ceased at once, and a ray of light flashed across my eyes, accompanied by a sound of far distant singing. The light grew brighter and brighter, and the singing more distinct. And soon I caught the word, this is the new song, redeemed, redeemed. I at once sprang from the bed where I had been lying for 20 hours without meat or drink and commit singing, redeemed, redeemed, glory, glory, such joy and peace as filled my heart when I felt that I was redeemed and could sing the new song. So she has this experience where she is now able to sing the new song of redemption. This is how she relays her conversion experience. After this experience, she says, in peace, with her heart. And she is now able to take part in this new song. Now, after she has this um, really profound conversion experience, she also has another really um, divine encounter, if you will, when she requests the gift of sanctification from God. And when she requests this gift of sanctification, of purification from God, she has this, another really profound experience. She says, the glory of God seemed almost to prostrate me to the floor. There was indeed a weight of glory resting upon me. 
She has this great expanse of the glory of God resting upon her. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, and glory to the Holy Ghost, who has plucked me as a brand from the burning and sealed me with eternal life. I no longer hope for glory, he says, but I had the assurance of it. Praise the Lord for Paul-like faith. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. She receives this of purification, sanctification, and has this really beautiful experience with the glory of God resting upon her. And then she goes on to write about how she makes Paul's prayer her own prayer. This my constant prayer was answered, that I might be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that being rooted and grounded in love, I might be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and breadth and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and be filled with all the fullness of God. She takes that prayer from Ephesians 3, 16 through 19, and that becomes her prayer. She said, I have been afraid to tell my mother I was praying for sanctification. Now remember, she's only a teenager at this point. But when the old man was cast out of my heart and perfect love passion, I lost all fear. So she talks about after these experiences, there's a kind of a boldness that she has about her faith. And she shares it with her mom and her family and her friends. Now, after she um, receives this gift of sanctification and she is converted, she also gets the call to preach. And she talks about that in her autobiography as well. And she's very, very hesitant accept this call. She says, day by day, I was more impressed that God would have me to work in his vineyard. I thought it could not be that I was called to preach. I, so weak and ignorant. Still, I knew all things were possible with God, even to confounding the wise by the foolish things of this earth. Yet in me, there was a shrinking. You can see here how she's echoing Paul's language in 1 Corinthians, right? How God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And yet, even though she knows this, right, she still is kind of very hesitant about accepting this call from God. But she does accept it. She does take on those who say women should not preach. And one of the things that people were saying to her was, it may have been okay in the Bible days for women to preach, but it's not okay now for women to preach. And so she, in this quote, she tackles that point of view. She says, I could not believe that it was a short-lived impulse or spasmodic influence that impelled me to preach. I read that on the day of Pentecost was the scripture fulfilled as found in Joel 228 and 229. And certainly it will not be denied that women as well as men were at that time filled with the Holy Ghost because it is expressly stated that women were among those who continued in prayer and supplication, waiting for the fulfillment of the promise. She's talking about when they were waiting in the upper room, right? And women were there just as well as the men. And so we know that um, it's okay for women to proclaim the gospel. And then she goes on to say, women and men are classed together. And if the power to preach the gospel is short-lived and spasmodic in the case of women, it must be equally so in that of men. And if women have lost the gift of prophecy, so have men. She's trying to turn that argument on its head, right? If you're going to say it's spasmodic for women, then it has to be the same for men because they're classed together in the upper room. And then she goes on to write, the Bible puts an end to this strife when it says there's neither male nor female female in Christ Jesus. Philip had four daughters that prophesied or preached. Paul called Priscilla as well as Aquila his helper, or as in the Greek, his fellow laborer. The same word which in our common translation is now rendered a servant of the church, and speaking of Phoebe, is rendered minister when applied to Tychicus. Now this is really amazing that she knows this, right? That the same Greek word that is used, that Paul used to talk about Phoebe. In some translations in the King James Version, which is the version she was using, it was translated servant when applied to Phoebe. 
But that same word diakonos is used for Tychicus in Ephesians and in the King James Version translated as minister. So she realizes that the same word is used to describe a man as well as a woman, but it's translated differently. And so she lists uh, the same word in our common translation. Um, so there should be no difference, but it's saying between, why can't Phoebe be called a minister? Because it's the same, same um, term there. Then she goes on to write, when Paul said, help those women who labor with me in the gospel, he certainly meant that they did more than to pour out tea. I love that quote from her. In the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul gives direction to men and women how they should appear when they prophesy or pray in public assembly. And he defines prophesying to be speaking to edification, exhortation, and comfort. She was really a fierce, fierce, fierce preacher. <laughs> now at the end of her autobiography, she has this beautiful section where, that she calls a word to my Christian sister. And this, um, I'm just giving you a few quotes here from that section where she is encouraging women to follow their call. She says, dear sisters, I would that I could tell you a hundredth part of what God has revealed to me of his glory, especially on that never to be forgotten night when I received my high and holy calling. Sisters, shall not you and I unite with the heavenly host in the grand chorus? If so, you will not let what man may say or do keep you from doing the will of the Lord or using the gifts you have for the good of others. You can see here how she's encouraging women to follow their call. Be not kept in bondage by those who say, we suffer not a woman to teach. It's quoting Paul's words, but not rightly applying them. There is a sense that Julia Foote has that when you look at how women, how Paul talked about women in his ministry, Paul is definitely not, um, he is not, he is not saying women should not preach or teach. Because when you see how he talks about women in ministry alongside of him, then he is actually encouraging women to preach and teach. And so you can see here what he says when people are saying, we suffer not a woman to teach, quoting Paul, they're not rightly applying his words. Significance of Foote's biography, it's, is really um, monumental. For one, it demonstrates her utilization of Pauline scripture as we've seen. And when she talks about her autobiography, like when she sought the gift of, of purification and sanctification, she really believed what Paul wrote in Romans 6, that sin has no dominion over the believer. And so she talks about the, the termination of sin's dominion. Paul's prayer, as we saw, becomes her own prayer. Male supremacy is terminated in um, her, her autobiography talks about how women in ministry with Paul that we just saw, that there is no um, male supremacy in terms of ministry. Women, as well as men, can preach and proclaim the gospel. Her, her autobiography is also important because it demonstrates her faith in God and God's call upon her life. And throughout her autobiography, similar to Jarena Lee and Zilpha Elah that we talked about the last time, she talks about these really divine, profound encounters that she has with God. And she, this autobiography also demonstrates, I think, the resilience of early Black women preachers. Because even though she faced a lot of opposition, she continued to proclaim the gospel. She traveled throughout the United States preaching. She went to Canada and preached. And so she remained steadfast for a calling, even though she did face quite a bit of opposition. So we've talked a lot in the last presentation and with Julia Foote about um, early interpreters of Paul. Now I kind of want to move into late 19th century, early 20th century, and just kind of talk a little bit about the context, right? But once you get past the Civil War, you have Reconstruction, um, the federal troops are removed from the South, 
you have the Supreme Court ruling in 1883 that invalidated the Civil Rights Act of 1875. So the Civil Rights Act of 1875 came out of Reconstruction, and it said that everyone, no matter what race they are, has full access to all accommodations, can't be turned away from service. So it really was a civil rights act that um, Blacks could um, visit churches, they could be served in restaurants, they could be turned away on kind of race. It also said that Blacks could serve on jury, which wasn't possible before the Civil Rights Act of 1875. But in 1883, the Supreme Court invalidated the Civil Rights Act and said that people could be um, denied service based on race, which gave rise to 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. And so you also have um, in the Captain Wilson administrations, the advancement of segregation and Blacks losing the right to vote. So there's a lot happening um, post Reconstruction, post Civil War. So this quote from Jacqueline Grant in the next slide, I think, kind of caps it encapsulates what's happening in the South, particularly even after um, the Civil War and, and Reconstruction and early 20th century, really. He says the end of slavery as a formal legal institution brought neither change in the image nor significant change in the condition of Black people in the United States. The image that Blacks were inferior and that they were intended to serve as white America remained intact. Consequently, when free Blacks sought work, they were relegated in the labor market to the same service job and menial work which, had, um, which they had service during, uh, I'm having problems with my, Computer. Okay, let's see if we can get this. There we go. They have been. They were re relegated in the labor market to the same service jobs and menial work, which have been forced upon them during slavery. So, as you can see from the invalidation of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and as we talked about in the last presentation, this idea of Black inferiority really remained, unfortunately. Um, and so when you have in the South, particularly the rise of Jim Crow, the rise of segregation, you have um, the rise of lynchings during this time. And so one of the things my project wanted to do was to also talk about how do African-Americans in light of the historical context continue this Black tradition of using Paul to protest racism and injustice in the early 20th century. So I talk a, a lot about the early interpreters, so now I want to spend a few minutes on some interpreters in the early 20th century in light of the context of segregation and descendant of enslavement, of, of slavery. Ida B. Robinson is another really wonderful figure she founded the largest African-American Pentecostal denomination established by a woman. Um, it's the largest denomination led by an African-American woman. And her denomination was called Mount Sinai Holy Church of America. And it upheld and fostered women in leadership. Ida B. Robinson is interesting for a number of reasons. One, she was ordained in the United Holy Church of America. And after she was ordained in that denomination, a lot of other women sought ordination in that denomination. And so the leadership of that church decided, okay, I think we need to put a break on this. So they stopped ordaining women. And this caused Ida B. Robinson to go on a fast. She went on a fast to pray to, do, to kind of figure out what she should do. Should she stay in this denomination that ordained her or should she leave? And so she goes on a fast for quite a bit of time in prayer. And she comes out of this fast and she says that she believed God told her to start this new denomination, the Mount Sinai Holy Church of America, and um, have this denomination be one that really fosters women in, in ministry. And so she goes out and starts this denomination. 
And she's known for saying this. She's faced a lot of opposition because she was a woman. If Mary, the mother of Jesus, could carry the word of God in her womb, why can't women carry the word of God in their mouth? She is known as um, a, a pastor, a bishop. She starts this denomination and um, really does take off, if you will. Starts in Philadelphia, but she ends up having churches in the South, churches um, in South, um, South America. And um, women are ordained in this denomination and they are lifted up in leadership, even as bishops. Estrella Alexander says this about Robinson. She says, even though her own future in a United Holy Church would probably have been secure, Robinson's intention in starting her movement was specifically to establish an organization in which every woman minister would have full freedom to participate in every level of ministry and in which women would have full clergy rights, including the right to ordination as bishop. Accordingly, every action she took as head of the newly formed denomination reflect this commitment and intention. So Robinson is fascinating because in her church, she not only is about women or ordaining women, but she's also very community oriented. So she, she purchases a farm where she could feed those in her community. She starts a school so that students, kids could be educated. She has a radio program early on. This is the early 1900s where she's on, she's broadcasting on the radio preaching. And um, she's also surveyed by the FBI because in, she speaks out against the war. She's a pacifist. She speaks out against the war. And they think that she may be in cahoots with Germany. She's a very um, popular speaker and preacher. But she also, in her radio broadcast, speaks out against racism and the lynching that are happening in the South. But she also has churches in the South in part, part of her denomination. And one of her sermons is called Economic Persecution. And in this sermon, a few excerpts from her sermon, she compares what's happening in the South in terms of lynching to what, what has happened in the early days of Christianity. And she says, in the early days of Christianity, under the old order of things, everyone who openly called on the name of the Lord Jesus was persecuted indescribably. Many of them died calling on the name of the Lord to the very end. At present, the same conditions prevail in substance. Our people in certain southern states are killed, their bodies dismembered and thrown to the vultures. This, of course, is a common occurrence and unfortunately occurs where Christianity is more prevalent than any other part of our union. So, you know, she's talking about the Bible Belt there, right? So many lynchings are happening in the South where there's supposed to be Christianity practiced there. She says, the South ignore the words of the sacred book they pretend to love so dearly. Again, she can see that Robinson kind of calling out this really hypocritical Christianity when these lynchings are taking place in a, in, a, in, in a place in the United States where Christianity is supposed to be so popular. And she goes on to say in this sermon, there is but one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. So that if God is the father of all, the relationship that exists between Gentile and Jew as well as Ethiopians, is inseparable and unquestionably established. But here Robinson is appealing to God as the father of all, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so this appeal to the fatherhood of God is appeal to one humanity, right? To the one humanity. He says, let us thank, pray that the Constantine of our day, if there be one, sends a letter the modern pagans in the polluted Southland in the form of anti-lynch legislation that is now pending in Congress. So she asked for prayer that the Constantine, similar to it for the early church, that there may be a Constantine for her day. And there was at this time when she did the sermon, there was some anti-lynching legislation pending in Congress. And so her prayer is that this um, legislation would be passed that God would raise up 
a constant thing that will allow this legislation to be passed. Robinson is important because she uses Paul's words to denounce the nation's refusal to stop the lynching of African Americans, as we saw in the quote above. Also, the language of God's fatherhood is important for her because the fatherhood of God um, signifies that the bond God creates between people of different races. There's a bond, one humanity. And so this bond demonstrates that Black lives are just as important as white lives. She is also a um, significant figure because, again, she's calling out the South for their hypocrisy. The fatherhood of God means that humanity is one family and that the atrocities taking place in the South such as the lynchings, indicate that the Christianity of the South is really no faith at all. She, she also was a very bold, bold woman. Robinson has not received adequate recognition and is still virtually unknown to scholars and the general public, but her legacy survives through the denomination she founded and the church she established in Philadelphia. And I think that's an important quote by Thomas. Um, I did not had not heard of Robinson until I started doing my research. And the more I learn about her, the more I'm intrigued and fascinated by her, her, um, her tenacity and her, her boldness. So I want to end with um, King, which I'm sure we all have heard of. And so another important figure in the 20th century. He has been called a prophet, a trombone, a drum major for justice, a theologian of resistance. As we all know, he was born in Atlanta, Georgia. He graduated, graduated high school when he was 15 years old. He received his bachelor's degree from Morehouse College. He also graduated from Crozer Theological Seminary in 1951. He became the pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. And that's where he led the, the infamous um, Montgomery bus boycott when Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. He received his PhD from Boston University in 1955. Now King uses Paul throughout his many sermons and speeches. And so in the book, I only talk about a few of them. Um, I hope to go back at some point and just focus on King and Paul. But the, the particular um, speech I wanna focus on for, uh, for the next few minutes is the speech in which um, he writes, a letter to America, Paul's letter to America. And this is where King pretends like he's Paul. And so he writes a letter to America. Um, he's taking on Paul's persona. And in the beginning of the letter, he, he writes it like a Pauling letter. And he um, addresses America right at the beginning. So he uses a typical Pauling letter greeting. He writes, Paul calls to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to you who are in America. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a really fascinating um, letter, sermon, essay, if you will, where King is pretending he's Paul and he's addressing America in this particular piece. At King as Paul praises America for its achievement. He says, through your scientific genius, you have made of the world a neighborhood. You have failed to employ your moral and spiritual genius to make of it a brotherhood. There's this sense of praising America for their technological advances, but the moral and spiritual progress not with its technological or scientific progress. And then he writes, I'm um, using Romans 12, one, American Christians, I must say to you what I wrote to the Roman Christians years ago, be not conform to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so here King in this essay is really urging America, the Americans to say, to, to realize that the Christian lifestyle must accompany the Christian name. And they cannot, Christians cannot allow society rules cannot follow society rules that violate scripture. If a rules that violate scripture, King says, you can't follow those. And that's what he's meaning. He says, be not conformed to this world, right? We can't conform 
to the world's prescriptions. And he goes on to say, and it's really powerful, say, I understand that there are Christians among you who try to find biblical basis to justify segregation and argue that the Negro is inferior by nature. Oh, my friends, this is blasphemy and against everything that the Christian religion stands for. I must repeat what I've said to many Christians before, that in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Similar to foot, um, King appeals to Galatians 3.28, right? Moreover, I must reiterate the words I uttered on Mars Hill. God that made the world and all things therein has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. So Americans, I must urge you to be rid of every aspect of segregation. Segregation is a blatant denial of the unity which we have in Christ. So King, taking on Paul's persona, appeals to Acts 17.26 and raises up the unity, the oneness of humanity in Christ. King utilizes Paul in a number of ways in this particular essay. He uses, uses Paul to critique and reject segregation, the notion of black inferiority, declare that segregation is sin and those who sanction it are not following the word, although they claim to be Christian. Kind of a similar critique as we saw in Robinson, right? Um, he uses Paul to speak of the suffering that one, that one will encounter when rejecting segregation. There's a part in the essay when he talks about if you stand up against segregation, you will suffer. But he links that to Paul's suffering, right? Because he's, he's in the persona of Paul. And in, in the persona of Paul, he says, I suffer because I'm standing up for the gospel. Likewise, if you resist segregation, you too will suffer. And just to kind of recap from part one and part two, how many of these African-Americans employed Pauline scripture. They employed Paul to protest and resist white supremacy and injustice. And it's interesting that each one of them, they do it in their own way, right? They do it using different passages of scripture. They also use Paul to demonstrate black agency. And I think that's important to think about that they were using their agency um, given by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit speak out, right? They became subjects, um, not objects at which scripture was aimed, but subjects interpreting scripture through the presence and the power of God. Exposed nation's hypocrisy. We saw that a number of these interpreters calling out um, the nation for its um, hypocrisy in terms of um, uh, segregation and, and enslavement and being bold and speaking out, right? And speaking to the nation and willing to suffer for that if need be. They also use Pauline scriptures to empower black communities, help those in their audience see the image of God in them and to help them to know that they um, are worthy and that they are made in the image of God and that God loves them and that God empowers them to speak out, empowers them to go forth in whatever God has called them to do. And as we saw in a number of, of these interpreters, Paul is important to advocate for unity, right? The, the fatherhood of God, um, that was an important uh, part of scripture for them to talk about the fatherhood of God, one humanity. God is made of, God is made us of one blood, all the nations of the earth. The other thing I should have added on this slide um, in terms of the, these African-American women that we've talked about, Paul was important for them to advocate their, um, uh, their sanction for preaching, their sanction to preach. So even though people were using Paul to try to silence them, they used Paul to say that actually Paul condones women preaching, um, condones the ordination of women, Saw in Paul really a companion, a companion, if you will, um, in their journey, in their ministry journey. I want to make sure I have time for Q and A. 
I think I'll just end with this. I'll end with this slide. Um, get the good summary of what all of these different African Americans how they employed Paul. Thank you so much for for coming back and giving us that additional information. I I love these women that you have introduced us to, uh, like uh, Julia Foote and Ida Robbins, and they just I do too. <laughs> they fill my heart because um, they are fierce women. Yes, and, um, indeed. You know, yeah. So so thank you so much for introducing introducing us to them. Um. So yes, we are going to move into some question and answer now. So uh, if you could all do me a favor and use the raise hand function in your uh, reactions. So down along the bottom of your screen, you'll see the raise the reaction button. If you click on that, you'll be able to see the option to raise your hand. And once I call on you, then um, you'll be able to unmute yourself and um, engage with Dr. Bowens. Um, I've just given you all that ability to unmute yourself. So uh, as folks are getting their questions ready or their comments, um, I just had one question for you, uh, Dr. Bowens. Mm -hmm. It struck me that there are like two parallel struggles that are going on. Um, that, that you're talking about. So w the one is the struggle that women are having within mm -hmm. their churches to be preachers and ministers and leaders. Mm -hmm. um, then of course, there's the struggle against racism that the mm -hmm. black, uh, community as a whole is, is working. And I wondered if you ever, um, I'm thinking about Ephesians in particular, and I forget exactly the, the chapter and verses, but it's the household code. Mm -hmm. So where wives are su to be submissive mm -hmm. to their husbands, um, and of course, they're, yeah. they're supposed to treat women with respect. And mm -hmm. it's the same thing for, um, for slaves. Slaves are supposed to obey mm -hmm. their masters with fear and trembling or whatever the expression. Right. I wondered if you encountered any... Um, direct responses to that from um, these women or from some of the African-American authors that you were researching? Yeah, so a good question. So um, I, I'm not going to say there aren't any direct responses to it. Um, and if you remember, the, one of the petitions that we talked about the last time, is, uh, I think it was in January, the petitioners used those household codes in a really creative way, a way that I had not thought about. Um, they talked about it in terms of familiar, Black families, right? Um, and enslavement. Um, because slavery separates families, how can husbands love their wives? How can wives submit to their husbands? How can children obey their parents? So that's how they dealt with that those household codes in the in that petition, in a sense, kind of calling out the separation of families during enslavement. But you notice in that petition, they don't mention slaves obey your masters, right? They don't mention that part. They talk about the family part, the fam the familial structure of the, uh, and that's how they address um, that the household codes. Um, that is the only, the, that petition really was the only one that I can think of that actually kind of dealt with those household codes. Um, Lemuel Haynes doesn't deal with it directly. He says something to the effect of, um, just because slavery existed in the, in the Bible times doesn't mean it's right. So he he kind of deals with it kind of indirectly, but he doesn't like cite the household codes, but you kind of get a sense that's what he's kind of talking about because he's talking about slavery also in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. So he kind of goes about in a more indirect fashion. So he says something like, from the beginning, when sin entered the world, human beings have always engaged in actions that are not godly. So he, he puts kind of slavery in that box, right? 
people have always done things that are not um, that are not right, does it mean we need to continue? So he kind of gets at it in an indirect fashion. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. And That's a great question, though. Yeah. Yeah. No. It just it's it 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 struck me last time. I I didn't ask it because there were other questions coming up, and it struck me again this time. Um. So yeah. Thank you for that. It it's a tricky one. And it I is think, tricky. <laughs> yeah. I think what you say, you know, just like just because it existed during biblical times doesn't make it right. And mm -hmm. you know, Paul Paul is of course a product of his age, right? And so right. There's some good stuff in Paul, and then of course there's some. <laughs> There's some yeah. Stuff Paul. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And oh. there are some scholars who say, if I may just put this in there real quick, there's some scholars who say, you know, because you would say like Paul's a product of his time, could he ever have imagined like a world where slavery is non-existent? Right. Um, I think in Galatians 3:28, that passage that um we talked a little bit about earlier, um I think he imagines that at least for the church, right? Um, but the implications of that on a grander scale in society, could he have imagined a society without slavery? There are some who, who ask that question. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, thank you. I see, uh, Grace, you have your hand up. So let me bring you up on the screen here and go ahead and ask your question. Yes, um, it was kind of fitting for me to be joining in tonight because earlier today I was on a Zoom uh, presentation with Joan Chittister, the Benedictine from Erie, PA, oh. who is known all over the world and her advocacy for women in the church. And the title was The Divine Feminine. And she talked about how wisdom, Sophia, is con that's the spirit. And yeah. that, again, that we... We, the, the patriarchy keeps wanting to push women to the side, and yet we are equally created in God's image. Yeah. And we women, we women need to keep pushing and pushing and pushing for, she said, words matter. And the scriptures that we use, we need to make sure they are inclusive scriptures. And the books that we read, the publishers, we need to insist that when they are publishing these books, that the feminine and the masculine are to be working together because we are all created in God's image. There is neither male nor female, but male and female. And uh, she talked about um, the abortion issue and how we need to keep pushing for that, that men keep wanting to put women back in their place. But where is there, where is our place? The same mm -hmm. places where the men are. And that it was, it was just kind of neat to see the, the dovetailing of your presentation with what Joan was talking about this morning. Oh, thank you. Thank you, so Grace. She said, ladies, ladies, keep pushing. Keep <laughs> making those men listen up. <laughs> <laughs> thank the, you the for women, sharing The women that. do all the work and the men are taking the credit. <laughs> and I, I, I live in Baltimore and in Baltimore, we're just finding out that they are, they are in the process of reorganizing 61 parishes down to 25 parishes where they're merging several parishes and um, one will be called the seat and that's where liturgies will be on weekends, not the other churches. And in a number of those churches, they have schools connected and the Catholic schools will be closing too and they're gonna sell that property. Now they're saying it's to bring people closer together, but I kind of suspect that, you know, Bishop Laurie here is calling for bankruptcy because of the, the clergy abuse. And I'm wondering if that has really, is what they're really, trying to expect people to believe, yeah. but I think most of us don't believe that. Yeah. And one of the things, of course, that, um, thank you, Grace. One of the things, of course, that, you know, um, I think is lost in a lot of this is that we are called to have a preferential option for those who are poor and those who are vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that keeps coming up in um, in all of these um uh, writings that you're sharing with us, uh, Dr. Bowens, that, you know, um, Christianity, you know, sort of that I, you were describing as the hypocrisy uh, of Christians that they were, that the, that the writers were, were sharing with us or pointing out. Yeah. Yeah. We saw that in Robinson particularly, but I think you see it throughout, right? With King, we saw it in King and um, 
the other early interpreters we talked about, there is this constant thread of calling out the nation. You know, if we're a Christian nation, okay, then how can you justify in slavery? How can you justify segregation? So there, there is that constant thread throughout um, these interpreters really calling out yeah. it, what they see as hypocrisy. Yeah. Um, and thank you, Grace, for sharing that, because when you were talking, it made me think of Julia Foote's section, a word to my Christian sisters, right? Encouraging the women, <laughs> don't let what men may say or do stop you from using your gifts. I, when I read that part of her autobiography, it just felt, I just felt like chills going down my spine. Yeah. How can we say God is love and be showing all this hate and this Christian yes. nationalism and mm -hmm. the white church? Yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense. Yes, I think they. I think these interpreters would agree with you. <laughs> Racism hurts everybody. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Daryl, I brought you up on the screen. You have a question. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Dr. Bowens. That was thanks for lifting these voices. It's excellent. Um, and I. Um, I, I kind of recall from reading your book that there, there was also an FBI, was the FBI investigating uh, Ida Robinson? I think I remember something about that. Can you say a little bit about that? Yes. So she was a pacifist and in her radio broadcast, she spoke out against the war. Um, and so because of that, she got on the FBI's radar but also because her church was uh, an interracial church. So she had members of her church who were Germans and Italians. And that also kind of raised the red flag for the FBI. Um, they thought that maybe she was somehow um, working on the side of, of Germany. And so they surveilled her for that. Um, Eventually, nothing came came of that because she wasn't, of course, but because she was pretty bold and speaking out against the war and because her congregation was mixed. And I think, you know, when you think about during this time, this is like the night, night, early 1900s. So it was an unusual thing to have a Black woman pastor leading a multiracial congregation. So that also raised flags as well. So yes. Yeah, she was under FBI surveillance. Um, Thank you. For those reasons, yeah. That's how you know you're doing right. <laughs> good trouble, right? <laughs> yeah, good trouble. That's great. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Daryl. All right. Uh, Joan, uh, is it Plumley? Let me bring you up on the screen here, Joan. Um, thank you. Um, Dr. Bowens, for your presentation. It's, it was it's quite enlightening. Um, our parish uh, racial justice ministry team, of which I am the leader, is, is putting on an event later this month on Christian nationalism, ecumenical voices opposing Christian nationalism. And I heard some references to Christian nationalism in your talk. Could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think Christian nationalism has a long history in our country. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it goes really goes back, I think, to the founding of our country, right? This sense of America as the city on the hill, this sense of America as chosen by God, um, this sense of America as... Um, God's beloved, right? And mm -hmm. part of that kind of national identity that goes back to the founding of this country, there's so many different layers to it, right? There's an economic layer to it. There's also a layer of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess the sense, I don't know if entitlement is the right, is the right word I would, I would use that for now. Um, the sense that because America is chosen by God, it has the right, the entitlement to um, do 
you, for lack of a better word, to do harm to others in the name of God. Mm -hmm. so I, when I, and I say that because I think about the the um, the slave trade, right? Because America is chosen by God, we have a right to enslave these other human beings because these human beings help make America prosperous. America is chosen by God. But God has given us this ability. God has given us this right. God has given us this power to subjugate these peoples. Um, and the subjugation of these peoples is part of God's plan, part of God's plan for America. So I think this, nat this Christian nationalism really goes back, really, in my opinion, to the founding of the country. Because it, it, this idea of a Christian nation gave America in many ways its identity as God's chosen and as God's chosen the ability and the right to do things that really should never have been done. And so a lot of, when you think about the American enslavement, a lot of it was about eco economy, economic yeah. and power, right? Um, using these um, people for economic benefit, to make America powerful. Um, and so when you look at these interpreters, many of them call out the nation for, just for that, right? You say you're a Christian nation, but look at what you're doing. How can, the, the two cannot go together. The enslavement of human beings and um, naming yourself as Christian, those are antithetical to um, what, a, what, a, what a Christian should be about, what a Christian nation should be about. So I, I think, yeah, Christian nationalism has a long history in our country. Um, it's bubbling up now even more, I think, um, in light of the con the climate, the climate. But it's always, in my again, this is just my opinion. <laughs> it's always been here from the from the founding of the nation. Um, this sense of uh, American exceptionalism, I think, too, is part of it. Um, yeah, I don't know if that gets to your question, Joan. Does that get to your question at all? Were, were you yes. wanting something more particular or specific? Does it get to your question, Joan? Oh, okay. Yeah, and on that same topic, I just wanted to alert um, everyone to a link that I just put in the chat, <clears throat> excuse me, that I just put in the chat network, which is the Catholic Social Justice Lobby um, in Washington, D.C. Um, um, recently, I, it's maybe a year or two now old, um, but they, they did a, a presentation on um, basically U.S. Christianity, white supremacy, Christian nationalism, uh, and that, that recording is available at that link. And I do know that um, uh, Father Brian Massingale is one of the presenters, uh, so it might be, if people are interested in that, it really might be well worth uh, looking into. Thanks, Joan. Uh, let's see, Madonna H., I see you have your hand raised. Let me bring you up on screen here. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. I um, Martin Luther King died on my 10th birthday. And ever since then, I've been on a trajectory, wow. uh, which uh, I live in Canada and that took me to Memphis. And I carried this baby around with me in my knapsack. It's well-worn um, um, and have been carrying it all the time. And so you probably know that he also mentions Paul in um, letter to Birmingham, letter in Birmingham jail. Yes. Uh, I continue to think about the matter of being called an extremist and I, decided uh, I gained a bit of satisfaction. Was not Paul an extremist for the gospel of Jesus? I wear, bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Yes. I love that one. Yes. I wondered if you could talk a bit about Paul as an extremist. And and very quickly, so raised Catholic with a name like this, probably not a surprise. Um, I did not get my hands on the Bible myself. It was interpreted. So I am just reading it now. And coincidentally, this morning, 
I am on Paul's letter to Philemon. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. And in it, he asks Philemon to accept the slave. Mm -hmm. Is it Enosimus? Enosimus. Enosimus mm -hmm. as a brother, not mm -hmm. as a servant. Mm -hmm. And then I wouldn't force you to take him because I want you to take him out of brotherly love, not out of necessity. I wonder if you could, maybe you already touched that last time, but if you didn't, I, I would love to hear what you have to say about that one. Okay, great questions. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I've thought about which letter, which essay from King to talk about, because in King's work, Paul is all over the place. <laughs> like, he, he uses Paul everywhere in all his speeches, pretty much, in all his writings. But I focused on Paul's letter to his Paul's letter to American Christians, because in that one, he pretends like he's Paul writing to America. But my second choice was the letter from the Birmingham City Jail. I, I thought I would write about that. He uses Paul all over in that letter too, in many different ways. Um, and the, the passage that you just lifted up, he says, I bear in my body, right, the mark of the Lord Jesus. One of the ways he uses Paul in the letter of the Birmingham Jail is to talk about, um, so let me back up. So that letter, he's addressing eight white clergymen, right, who were saying, why are you here in Birmingham? You shouldn't be here, right? And one of the things King says is, well, just like Paul went around the Roman Empire preaching the gospel, I too have to, I'm, I too am called to preach the gospel of freedom in America. So I'm not an outside agitator, which was one of the things they were accusing him of. You're an outside agitator. You don't belong here in Birmingham. He's like, just like Paul was able to go around the Roman Empire preaching, I too I'm called to Birmingham. I must answer the Macedonian call for aid, right? So he uses Paul to talk about that. But he also uses Paul in that passage you lifted up when Paul says in Galatians, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus, right? Paul is talking about the actual physical mark that he bears in his body for the sake of the gospel. You know, he gives us a list in 2 Corinthians 11 of all the things he went through. He's been stoned. He's been shipwrecked. He's been beaten. He's had all these things happen to him. And you can see the scars of the suffering on his body. But similarly, King is lifting up, you know, in the first part of that letter, he talks about how they train for nonviolence. They practice nonviolence, asking people, can you suffer blows without retaliating? Can you have somebody hit you, beat you without retaliating? And so he talks about that in the letter, right? This kind of the sense of training for nonviolence. And then he also talks about the suffering that they went through, he and other civil rights workers um, being, being beaten. And so King too, similar to Paul says, I have, him, I have on my body the mark of the struggle. And so he lifts up that passage in Galatians, I bear in my body the marks of Jesus. Another way he uses Paul in the letter to talk about the sufferings that he and other civil rights workers go through, the marks he has on his body, the beatings he's as he has endured. And he also uses Romans 12 in that letter, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, right? And so that's part of that um, suffering piece, presenting, we, uh, we, we train for nonviolence because we were presenting our bodies as living sacrifices. So he's seeing really a, a, a sacredness to this work, right? A sacredness to the civil rights struggle in that his body and the bodies of these other civil rights workers are presented as sacrifices for the freedom of others. And the other place where he uses um, Paul in that letter, when he talks about being co-workers with God, and Paul uses that language in 2 Corinthians 6, that we have to be co-workers with God. And so King sees his struggle in the civil rights movement as being a co-worker with God. He's working with God to bring about justice. Um, and he talks about that in the context of he said someone had written him and said, you just need to wait. Things will eventually work out. Black people will eventually get their rights. You guys are moving too fast, slow down. And King comes back and says, no, we have, you can't just 
time is time is neutral. You have to use time creatively, right? And so he says, when we use time creatively by working with God, by being co-workers with God. So that's another way he uses um, Paul to talk about working with God's program of justice and, and equality. So your other question about um, Philemon. So Frederick Douglass has a really interesting interpretation of this passage in Philemon. Because we know Philemon was used as justification for the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, right? Um, because those who, pro who promoted that law said, well, Paul sent Onesimus back. If Paul sent Onesimus back, then if any slave runs away, they need to be sent back to their slave owner. So it becomes a really important letter for those who supported slavery. But Frederick Douglass takes on those who would use this letter for that purpose. He lifts up exactly what you said, Madonna. He says, when Paul sent Onesimus back to Philemon, he said, receive, receive Onesimus as a brother, right? And then he says, Paul says, not just receive him as a brother, but receive him as you would me. And so when Frederick Douglass is interpreting this passage, he says this, is, this can't be used to justify the Fugitive Slave Act because Paul says, receive him as you would receive me. And Paul is a free person. Receive him as you would receive a brother. Um, so um, when Douglass reads that, he reads it as Onesimus going back to Philemon, but not as an enslaved person as someone that Philemon should receive as his brother, as a free person. And I think I think Douglas's reading of that is, is, is spot on. I think he's reading it in, in the correct way. So yeah, that that letter is is a huge is a huge um piece for those to advocate for the Fugitive Slave Act but it also becomes an important piece for Douglas and other abolitionists who are saying to the, those, to the slaveocracy, you're not reading this letter correctly, right? You're not reading it like it should be read. It actually advocates for freedom and not for enslavement. I also read it as, that it's more that you you there will have to be a shift in spirit mm. that will be that I want you as a brother, not I need to do this now. It's it's yeah. it's not it, like I know that King said um, the law may not make you love me, but it'll stop you from hitting me. But it mm -hmm. is a step in the right direction toward wanting not to hit you and then <laughs> wanting to love. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly enough, at the end of that letter, Paul says, um, I'm going to come visit you. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of like he's saying, you know, receive him as receive him as a brother, receive him as me. And by the way, I'm going to stop by and see if you actually done it. <laughs> Have you actually received Onesimus back as I've asked you to do? So, yeah. Thank you, Madonna. Um, we are coming up on our time here. So Dr. Bowens, again, thank you so much for being with us uh, both in January and tonight. I know I've learned so much from you um, and it, it looks like so many of our folks have too. So really thank you. It, it's just been a pleasure to engage with your work and your brilliance. So thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. I've enjoyed being with you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.